creation of the world, God loved us. In the warmth of a sunrise, in the rainbow after a storm, through signs and wonders, promises and dreams, he showed his love through the law, through judges and prophets and kings, through floods, famines, furnaces, and fish. He parted the waters, led nations to new lands, closed the mouth of lions, and rained down fire from heaven. But in all that he had done, we still did not understand the great mystery of his love. So he did something we never imagined. He grew silent. But in the silence, he was preparing us. The world awakened to the very presence of God. On a quiet night in Bethlehem, the earth shook with a heavenly host, announcing the good news that would change the course of eternity. God's only son, perfect and holy, come down to dwell among us. But how would he come? A brave warrior like Joshua? A triumphant king like David? A bold prophet like Elijah? No, in God's infinite kindness, he chose a humble baby, our infant God, here with us. This is the mystery of Christmas. And now our hearts are bursting with joy. Like the star that scattered its light across the night sky, our voices ring out in praise. We join with the angels and sing. This divine gift of God, asleep on the hay, has come. A gift of love for you and for me. What a glorious mystery. Merry Christmas, Community Church. We're so glad you're here. Would you stand with us as we sing together?
worship our King. Let's all sing this together. Joy, we will sing joy. We will sing. Shout of praise.
Church, we have such an opportunity to glorify our God tonight because of what he has done, because he is Christ the Lord. And on that, core, that bridge, it says, all the angels sing hallelujah. We get to join in with them. We get to join in and, and worship an awesome God who humbled himself and came as a baby to save us. Church, I'm in awe of such love. I'm in awe of, of a God who is willing to do that for those that he loves, to come down and die for us. So church, as, as we continue to sing, let's keep that in mind, just that awesome love that God has shown us. That he came as a baby to die for us, and we get to celebrate that today. Let's keep singing. forward for offering. Lord Jesus, we are so in awe of you. That you would humble yourself as a baby and come to us are your enemies. Those who have turned away from you, those who decided that we didn't want you, you came to rescue us. You came to demonstrate that love for us. So that while we were still sinners, you came and you died. Lord Jesus, we lift you up high. We praise you, Lord, for all our days. We thank you, Jesus, for that gift that you've given us. And right now, Lord God, we want to give back to you. We want to give back to your kingdom. We want to give back to what lasts. Because the things here on earth, they don't last. They are like a vapor. Our lives are like a vapor, and we get to only cling to you. So, Lord God, we give unto you, Lord Jesus, because you are worthy of it. 
So, Lord, I pray over this offering, over this gift, that you would use it for your glory, for your honor alone. We love you, Lord Jesus, and we just pray this in your name. Amen. surrender to you, God. When we sing Noel, we will come and we will be a part of what you're doing. Let's sing it.
Welcome, everyone. We are the Gumnus family. Um, on Christmas Eve, we light our fifth candle, which represents light and purity and is called Christ's candle. In lighting it, we celebrate the coming of our Savior and King. As we light the Christ candle on this Christmas Eve, we read from Luke 2, 1 through 20. And there were shepherds out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks by night. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were afraid. Fear not, the angel said, I bring you good news of great joy, filled for all people. We are on to you, as well in this day in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign on to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. Please join us in prayer. Gracious and mighty King, we remember your goodness to us as we celebrate the triumph and joy of Christmas. As your love has been revealed in all of its fullness, we pray that love may abound in our hearts on this special day. Grant us the spirit of Christ that we may live in the fullness of his character every day. In his holy name we pray. Amen. I want to say good morning, but it's not morning, right? Okay, we'll get some lights here. Yeah, that feels better. Well, good afternoon and Merry Christmas Eve to every single one of you. I'm so glad that you are here. Let me introduce myself. Uh, I am uh, Adam Utech. I'm the lead pastor here at uh, Community Church. And if this is your first time, we are so glad you're here. And we just like to play with our lights sometimes, just for fun. <laughs> Just for fun on Christmas Eve. Uh, and we're just glad you're here uh, today. Uh, to maybe you're with family or with some friends that you came with. Uh, or maybe you're part of our church family. And we are so glad that you are all here uh, today on this special, special day. My hope is that you will encounter God in such a powerful way in these moments that we have together. That God would totally transform your life. I don't know what stuff you're bringing in with you this Christmas Eve. What kind of baggage, what kind of hurt, what kind of brokenness. But God can meet you in that place. Uh, he is good and he is loving and he is kind beyond what we can even imagine. And so we're going to look at that today as we open God's word. But before we do that, I want to pray and ask that the Lord would speak to our hearts. Because this is not me or anything fancy or clever that I can come up with. This is God's word that we're going to be looking at together today. And we're just going to ask that the Lord would speak to us by his spirit. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Christmas. What a great time to reflect upon Noel. And we want to come and see God, what you have done, as we sang earlier, we pray that you would open our hearts, our minds to your word today. Lord, if there are any in this room uh, who do not know you as their personal Lord and Savior, I pray that they wouldn't leave today until they can know for certain that they belong to you, that they have received salvation in Christ. And so we just give this time to you. We thank you for it. 
We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you don't know us very well, Community Church, our mission is to develop gospel-centered disciples, sharing the hope of Christ to transform lives. That's what we're all about. Everything we do surrounds around this mission, and we believe uh, in the power of God's Word. And so that's what we do every week, every Sunday. By the way, we also meet on Sundays, just in case you were wondering. We meet on Sunday mornings every Sunday. In fact, you could come this Sunday. If it, maybe you're new to church, and this is kind of all new to you, but, but if you get grabbed by this and your experience with us today, uh, come back this Sunday. We only have one service At 9 a.m., 9 a.m., we have just that one service this Sunday, but we'd love for you to come, and we'll just continue to open God's Word and let Him speak to us. We're going to do that today, uh, today. So uh, does anybody know the song, I'll Be Home for Christmas? Go ahead, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Okay, if you've all raised your hand now, you have to sing it. That's, I know, I tricked you, but go ahead. Here we go. I'll get you started. I want us to all sing it like one big choir. You ready? The words will be up on the screen. Here we go, right? Oh, that's out of order. What is happening? Go back to I'll Be Home for Christmas. Can you go back to the slide before that? Or maybe I screwed up the slides. Here we go. Let's sing it. Ready? I'll You can plan on me. Please have. Not this year. And mistletoe. And presents on the tree. Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve will find me where the love light gleams. I'll be home for Christmas if only in my dream. Good job. Give yourselves a hand. Good job. So do you, you know this song? A lot of you know this song. It was first recorded by, anybody know? Bing Crosby in what year? Anybody? 1943. I wasn't alive. Many of you weren't alive, but some of you were, and you remember Bing Crosby singing this. It topped the charts in 1943. It was written by, uh, it was written uh, from the perspective of a soldier in World War II. Did you know that? Uh, Walter Kent wrote the music, and James uh, Gannon penned the words that we know so well. And so that's kind of the theme of this message today is I'll be home for Christmas because there's another young family uh, that was planning to move north. It was time. They were living in a community temporarily as refugees. They were escaping danger, escaping harm. And this family finally is able to go home safely, home for Christmas. And I'm talking about Joseph and Mary and Jesus. So for those of you who've been with us as we've been tracking through Matthew's gospel and looking at his account of the birth of Jesus, uh, we've seen that Jesus came to this earth Uh, And this past Sunday, we talked about evil King Herod, and after Jesus was probably a year and a half, almost two years old, King Herod found out from these magi from the east, these wise men from the east, that there was a king born, and then they figured out it was in Bethlehem, and so King Herod uh, sent soldiers to murder all the baby boys in Bethlehem, two years old and younger. So Herod was a ruthless ruler. Joseph was warned in a dream that this was going to happen, and so Joseph took his family and quickly escaped down to Egypt, where they lived among a community, a strong Jewish community that had formed centuries earlier. Imagine what that was like for Joseph and Mary and baby Jesus, having to get up in the middle of the night and flee for your lives. must have been a scary time for them. And then, of course, you're living among people that you don't know. They might be a Jewish community that they were able to live with, but this wasn't home for them. Egypt wasn't home. It's just not very comfortable. Have you ever traveled and gone somewhere for a long time that is just not home? It just doesn't feel very good, does it? Uh, Just this past October, I was able to go to Romania and visit one of our partner churches in Romania. You can see a picture. Here's the People's Palace in uh, Bucharest in Romania. And then 
uh, I was able to preach to that church, that sister church that we have there in Galatz. Uh, it was a great opportunity. Uh, and I actually talked to Pastor Mihai earlier today. He called me this morning uh, using uh, inst- no, not Instagram. It was uh, the Facebook Instant Messenger uh, voice. So he's calling me on the road, and we're talking, and it's like evening there when I was talking to him. But it was a great opportunity for me just to be there and see a different culture and be in a different culture. But you know what? After a week... I was ready to go home, right? I was ready to go home to my family. I was ready to go home to my kind of food. I was ready to go home to my culture, my language, my currency, and yes, my time zone, right? You just, you know how it is if you travel a long way and you you just don't want to stay there. You want to go home. And I think that's what it was like for Joseph and Mary and Jesus, Joseph and Mary especially, they wanted to go back to Israel. That was where they were from. That's, those are the people they knew. They had family and friends there. So now the wait is over, and they're going to be home for Christmas. And that leads us to our text today. So if you have a Bible, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 2. So if you have a Bible with you, you can turn to Matthew chapter 2, or you can open up this uh, handy-dandy thing called a smartphone. Have you ever heard of this? It's this new invention. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, you can open up your smartphone if you have a Bible app and you can follow along in Matthew chapter 2. We're only going to look at a few verses here uh, this afternoon. Matthew chapter 2, verses uh, 19 through 23. If you grabbed a Bible off the cart as you came in, maybe you grabbed one of those, you can turn to page 856. We're going to look at all these verses, talk about what it may mean for our lives today. Uh, But here is the main point. Here's the main idea I want us to understand today from this short passage from Matthew 2. It's really one challenge for us today. It's one thing. If if you could leave today and you say, what what did that preacher guy talk about? Here's the one thing that I want you to remember. Come home to God. Come home to God. Now that applies in many different ways to many different people in this room. But that's the challenge. Come home to God. To God, I don't know where you are this Christmas. Maybe, maybe you're far from God, you, you, and you're just appeasing mom by being here, or grandma, or you're appeasing a friend who just keeps badgering you to come to church with them. Well, I'm glad you're here, but I want to tell you, you can come home to God. doesn't matter where you've been. doesn't matter what you've done. You can come home to God. Maybe you know Christ, you've had a relationship with him, but you know what? You're just not really walking with Christ. You're not reading his word, you're not seeking him, you're not being obedient to what he calls you to do, and you've been sort of off living for yourself. I want to tell you, you also can come home to God. You can come home to God. And maybe you are faithful and you're following Christ and you're living for him. And here's the question for you, who can you help come home to God? Maybe there's someone in your life, a family member, a friend, that you can help them come home to God. That's the challenge for us this afternoon. Let's look at God's word. Let's look at Matthew 2, 19 and 20. Look at Matthew 2, 19 and 20. Here's what it says. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel, because those who intended to kill the child are dead. So just in case you don't know me very well, I I have this problem with crazy dreams. I have a sleeping problem. I've inherited from my uh, father. Thanks, Dad. He's here today. Uh, I walk in my sleep, and I talk in my sleep. I say some crazy things. One time I was snoring in bed, and my wife said, Adam, Adam, just turn over. And I said, turn over? I, I was... Just not with it. And, and she said, no, no, move to the other side. Like, turn over, turn over onto your side. And I said, I don't want to take sides. <laughs> so these are the kinds of things my wife has to put up with. Pray for her. Uh, in fact, when I was in college, true story, when I was in college, my roommate saw all kinds of crazy things, uh, weird things. I hid under my own desk for no apparent reason in my sleep. Uh, all kinds of weird things that some of my, my uh, guys on my floor would ask my roommates. So, so Andy, did, did anything happen last night? Anything exciting? <laughs> Any stories to share? Uh, I did all kinds of crazy things. So then when I got married, uh, my wife said, you're going to the doctor and you're getting on medication. So I didn't. And I have been for, for many years. But so if I told my wife, honey, an angel appeared to me in a dream and told me to move to Canada. You know what she would say? 
go back to the doctor and up your dose. But for Joseph, this was a divine sign. This is God speaking to Joseph. This had become a normal thing for him. Because it was the Lord who came to Joseph in a dream, warning him about Herod that led them to Egypt in the first place. In fact, earlier in chapter 1 of Matthew, it was the Lord who spoke to Joseph in a dream, telling him that this pregnancy that Mary had had was from the Holy Spirit, and that it was okay for him to go ahead and take her as his wife. And now, again, the Lord is appearing to Joseph, revealing a truth that he couldn't have known otherwise, and that is this, that Herod is dead. Herod is dead. So the historical context, for just really briefly to understand, when Herod knew that he was in his last days, this is toward the very end of his life, he knew his life was almost over, he went down to Jericho. Jericho uh, was like Door County. It was where all the timeshares were. And people would vacation in Jericho, and that's where Herod went. And he he had all the noble families of Israel come down to Jericho with him, and he put them in the Hippodrome, which is a horse racing track, and he ordered, listen, he ordered his soldiers, the moment that I die, I want you to slay all the noble families of Israel. Why? Why would he do that? Because Herod wanted the people, the nation, to mourn on the day of his death, and they, he knew that they wouldn't mourn for him when he died but they would mourn for these families. And so here this tension is thick. All these families are gathered, and Herod died. Thankfully, the soldiers didn't obey Herod's orders. So when he was dead, they opened the Hippodrome, and all the families were released, and no one was killed. And then Herod's will was read publicly, and his son, Archelaus, was hailed as king. And that's important because we're going to come back to that. But because Herod had died, it's safe now for Joseph to bring his young family back to Israel. So they'll be home for what? Christmas, right? So how would Joseph respond to this dream, this revelation? We can see it in verses 21 and 22. Here's what it says. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and entered the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father, Herod, he was afraid to go, to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the region of Galilee. Joseph was a good man and a good guardian for his family. These were dangerous times. The text says that when Joseph heard Archelaus was ruling, what does it say? He was what? He was afraid. He was afraid. Why? When Herod died, his kingdom was split into three parts. One region for each son. He has three sons. Here's a picture you can see on the map. Archelaus ruled over Judea. This is the southern part of Israel. This is a large region. Archelaus uh, was brutal just like his father. And it got so bad that a delegation of both Samaritans and Jews, if you know anything about Samaritans and Jews, they didn't get along. So it had been pretty bad for them to work together. Samaritans and Jews came to the Roman ruler, Caesar Augustus, and begged him to remove Archelaus from his rule. And Augustus agreed. In AD 6, Archelaus was banished. So Judea was not a safe place for Jesus to grow up. And that's why Joseph and his family didn't move back to Judea, to the southern part of Israel. So Bethlehem, where they had lived, that's not going to work. That's part of Judea. Jerusalem, no, not going to work. And so they went north. They went up to Galilee. This is near the Sea of Galilee, where a lot of Jesus' miracles and teachings took place was near Galilee or in Galilee. So there they are in Galilee, end of verse 22. Galilee was the region ruled by Herod Antipas. You can see on the map, I believe, if you can really squint your eyes. This was another one of Herod's sons. It was a good place to blend in, to lay low, tucked away in the hills near the Sea of Galilee. You can see picture, a picture here. Uh, these hills roll in this region. It's a really good place to kind of lay low and have a low profile. Many towns are built on the edges of these hills. Here's a, an example. So this is where Jesus, the area where Jesus grew up. Where exactly, what town exactly did Jesus grow up in? Anybody know the answer? Yeah, yeah, Nazareth. We're going to see it in verse 23. Look at verse 23. Then when he went and settled in a town called Nazareth to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets, 
that he would be called a Nazarene. So Nazareth was a good choice. It did not attract a lot of attention. In fact, most Jews even avoided going to Nazareth. Many retired Roman soldiers lived there. It was a small town, probably 200 to 1,000 people. As he lived uh, in Nazareth. Here's a picture of modern-day Nazareth. You can see on uh, the screen it's pretty large now because of the fact that Jesus grew up there. It's a tourist destination. But here's the question. This is really interesting here. Why does it say that Nazareth fulfills what was spoken through the prophet, that he would be called a Nazarene? See, Nazareth, if you searched, if you read the whole Old Testament, okay, you would never find Nazareth. Nazareth isn't mentioned by any of the prophets. So what is Matthew doing here? Well, scholars believe that Na- Matthew had a, a very specific thought in mind, and that was Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. I'll have it up on the screen. It says this, Then a shoot will grow from the stump of Jesse... And a branch from the, his roots will bear fruit. So the word branch in Hebrew is neser, neser, nesereth. Anybody catch that? You, you hear it? Nesereth, Nazareth. That's the, what Nazareth was nicknamed. In fact, the town of the branch. You could call it the town of the branch. Now notice in Isaiah 11.1, 1, this mentions that the branch traces to who? To Jesse, who is the father of David, in whose line Jesus came. We can see that in the beginning of Matthew chapter 1. So Nazareth was a town of ethnic diversity. People came to live there, and in fact, the enemies of the Jews lived there. Some, like I said before, some retired Roman soldiers lived there, and many other Gentiles lived there. So in John's gospel, there's a little interaction about Nazareth. Philip goes and tells Nathanael that the Messiah, the promised one, had come and that he was from Nazareth. And so what did he say? What did Nathanael say? He said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? It's like, can anything good come out of Watoma? (laughs) Now, if you're from Watoma, you're the exception, all right? I actually looked up this week just to get an example, and I found that Watoma is like the third worst place to live in Wisconsin or something like that. Anyway, I know. Whoa. Anybody from Watoma? I'm going to really get in trouble. But, but that's what it was like. It was like, oh, can anything good come from Watoma? Anything good come from Nazareth? And what did Philip say? Do you remember? I just love it. He says to Nathaniel, come and see. Come and see see for yourself. He did, and his life was forever changed. Jesus came to provide the way for us to come home to God. Perhaps you need to come and see for yourself. You need to come and see Jesus this Christmas. You need to come home to God. See, Jesus fulfills all the prophecies in the Old Testament, which is incredible, amazing. It's not a coincidence. He lived, in fact, a perfect life, fulfilling the law. He did what we could not do. He succeeded where we failed because all of us have sinned. Every single one of us in this room, we've sinned. We've chosen to sin. We were born into sin. And you might say, well, I'm not that bad. I'm not a murderer like Herod. Boy, he is bad, right? He was a sinner. Uh, hell isn't for, for me. I mean, hell is for really bad people like Herod or Archelaus. But here's the problem. How bad is too bad to be condemned? Or, on the other side, how good is good enough to be accepted by God? And is it really up to us to determine who is worthy of eternal life with God? The Bible is actually very clear about our status when we stand before God. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned, and what does it say? And fall short of the glory of God. Even our good works, all the best efforts that we can bring to the table are described in Isaiah 64 as polluted garments, filthy rags. Listen to what Isaiah 64.6 says. All of us have become like something unclean, and all our righteous acts are like a polluted garment. All of us wither like a leaf. And our iniquities carry us away like the wind. See, our sin against an infinitely 
holy God condemns us. Even if we sin one time, we are a lawbreaker before a holy God, and we deserve eternal death, eternal separation from God, because God is so holy, and we're going to sing about that here at the end of the service today. And let's be honest, we've sinned more than one time. We sin more than once a day. We sin all the time. We've chosen to go our own way, and we've decided to follow our own desires, not God's. We sin a lot. That puts us in a really bad place because, see, we aren't as bad as we can be, but we are as bad off as we can be, and we stand before God. So what can we do about it? Nothing. There's nothing we can do. We're dead in our sins. Ephesians 2, verse 1. We cannot be good enough to get to God or be made right with God any more than an ant can do enough to become my friend. This summer, I had a bit of a a war with some ants in my yard. I killed them in one hill, and they just came back and made another one. It drove me crazy. I hated those ants. I used all kinds of different poisons to try to kill them. They were such a nuisance to me. They bothered me so badly. Now think about this. Could one of those ants, after ruining my yard, do enough to come to me and become my friend? No. (laughs) Who said yeah? Come on. I'm not going to be a friend. I'm going to kill it. Try to kill them all. I would squash him. So we, think about this, we who are infinitely smaller than God, mere specks of dust in the expanse of the universe, how can we ever delude ourselves into thinking that we can somehow make ourselves right with a holy God? We've made a mess of his creation with mounds of sin. We have thumbed our noses at God, and we think we can make up for it by not trashing his yard for a day or two. Here's the reality. The reality is that we are all equally in a bad spot without Christ. We really have no hope whatsoever. We, on our own, we have no hope. But what if, what if God would come down to us? What if God came to live with us, to show us the way, to pay the penalty that we deserve for our sin? This is exactly what Jesus did. He became an ant, so to speak. He allowed the people he created to arrest him, to wrongfully convict him, to torture him, and put him to death on a cross. Why? 1 Peter 2.24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that, having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. See, Jesus did this for you so you could be brought back into a right relationship with God. This is the gospel. This is the good news. So have you responded to this good news? The response is very simple. Repent of your sins. Repentance is a change of mind. It's moving from hating God and loving your sin to loving God and hating your sin. That's repentance. You're turning away from yourself and your sin, and you believe, it's the other side of that, you believe on Jesus alone, not yourself. You believe on Jesus alone. And when you respond in this way, you can be saved, or you can, as we've been saying, you can come home to God. You can come home to God. To God. I hope for you, this Christmas, you will make this decision. It's the most important decision of your life. Come home to God. Maybe you have put your faith in Jesus, but you've been wandering. You've been going your own way. You've not been following Jesus. You're like the prodigal son who ran off with his father's estate and spent it wildly. Perhaps this Christmas, you need to come home to God. You need to repent of going your own way and come back to Jesus and know, you need to know that he welcomes you back with open arms, not because you deserve it, but because Jesus' righteousness applied to you. See, Jesus, in fact, opened his arms 
on the cross so you could be welcomed back by God. This is God's grace. It is his gift to all of us. We could say that it's his Christmas gift to every single one of us. So how will you respond today? Will you come home to God? That's the big question I want to leave with you. And I want us to take some moments. I know it's busy. We're going to go off and we're going to eat cookies or we're going to run off to family events or dinner or whatever it is. You can spare a couple minutes to be quiet before God and listen to what his spirit is saying to you. So I want to give you a time to be quiet before God and the worship team is going to come. They're going to play quietly. And during that time, talk to God. Talk to God and then we'll close the service in a few moments. is in front of us. Will we come home to God? I hope that you will this Christmas. And if you are, if God is doing something in your heart, and I want to encourage you to fill out a connect card, put your name, your info on and say, I want to talk to someone and we will follow up with you this week. Come back this Sunday to our Sunday morning service. But let me pray and then we'll be dismissed as we sing together. God, you are so holy. You are so powerful and so awesome. And we give you the praise and you the honor be glorified as we go from this place we thank you so much god that you have come to save us in jesus name we pray
You alone are holy. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. You are holy. Thanks so much for coming today. Merry Christmas. And uh, please feel free to come back on Sunday morning. We were so glad to have you. Uh, please join us in the in the foyer to, to enjoy some refreshments and some conversation and some fellowship. Thanks so much for coming and God bless. Let's remember to return to Christ this season. God bless.